गुड इवनिंग टू एवरी वन मेनी ऑफ यू मे हैव ऑलरेडी गेस्ट फ्रॉम द वॉइस दैट वॉज गिरीश कारनाड्स डॉक्यूमेंट्री ऑन बेंद्रे एंड गिरीश कारनाड वॉज द नैरेक्टर इन दैट डॉक्यूमेंट्री इट्स अ लॉन्गर वन इट्स अ ट्वेंटी मिनिट डॉक्यूमेंट्री बट वी जस्ट थॉट इट वुड बी नाइस टू बिगिन विद दिस डॉक्यूमेंट्री टू गिव यू ऑल अ ग्लिम्स ऑफ Bendre the place that he lived his engagement with the world around him how he looked and how he recited his poems we thought it would be a good way to initiate this conversation and uh, that's why we played that 5 minute clip from a longer documentary um i recall what karnad had once said after a screening of this uh, documentary Uh, they had spent a couple of days at bendre's house uh, shooting and karnad kept giving him instructions sit there stand there uh, sit uh, you know let's have this backdrop you write this poem you recite the song everything and one shot had to be repeated and uh, karnad uh, told bendre let's repeat that shot and okay bendre said okay uh, i'm ready and then karnad said uh, can we get that cat which was there in the first shot so bendre is supposed to have told karnad bekken bendre en tilkondeno ni kardallella varakke okay so that was uh, that is something that i always remember when i watch this uh, documentary uh today is actually madhav's day and i have no business to be here but Uh, we have to get him to talk and that's i'm going to play a very minimal role and uh, madhav will do all the talking uh, datatreya ramachandra bendre <clears throat> one of canada's greatest poets um mystic poet he was someone who could magically stitch together the word the sound the philosophy everything and uh, kannada befittingly called him shabda garudiga varakavi so, someone who could not be comprehended you know by with common understanding of literature or poetry or philosophy bendre was uh, gifted he seemed uh, you know more than human uh, when one reads uh, his poems his writings the range uh, of subjects with which bendre could effortlessly uh, move he could move from history to maths to numerology to archaeology to poetry to kavya mimamsa bendre was a man who could do it all and uh, today in the kannada landscape we don't really uh, hear much of bendre um and i think uh, madhav's translation has come at the appropriate time rekindling memories of this uh, great poet and if at all this poet is still heard you know still listened to um we have to we owe it to the kannada bhavagite tradition which has kept bendre's poetry alive through songs and uh, in every kannada home bendre is still known through his bhavagites um madhav's uh, task task is a really daunting one it's not easy to translate bendre at all um at the outset bendre seems like you can accomplish him because it's after all you know you feel that it's a play of word you can get him through a turn of phrase um but that's just the exterior and, and even getting the exterior of bendre is uh, a very daunting task and that's why not many people have attempted to translate bendre i must say madhav has uh, uh, taken on a huge challenge and has accomplished it very successfully and i congratulate madhav for that um so let's uh, begin this conversation madhav by asking you uh, how did you chance upon bendre um, because you write uh, 
in your introduction that uh, you are not a reader of Kannada at all. How did you chance upon the most difficult and complex poet of Kannada and decide to translate him? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Can, am I heard? Yes. OK. Yeah, thanks, Deepa, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming here to BIC for the chance to have an event here. <laughs> Uh, like Deepa said, uh, Bendre really is a Varakavi, you know, which I've translated as heaven touched. Uh, vara meaning boon usually, but uh, I've translated as a heaven touched poet. And Deepa's right that uh, I came to Bendre with, out the knowledge of uh, him in a manner that uh, I consider destiny. Because uh, I grew up in Bangalore and went to Kendriya Vidyalaya. And uh, the KV I went to had uh, English as the first language, Hindi as the second, and Sanskrit as the third. And so I studied those languages, or got by in them at least, and uh, never studied Kannada. I spoke it at home with my father and his family mostly. I believe I studied it in kindergarten, but I forgot it as soon as I went into the first standard. So I have no memory of it. And uh, my point is that I learned the alphabet, or yeah, learned the alphabet, as many letters as they are when I was af after the 10th standard, is what I remember. And I don't know how many of you have learned a language that late, but it becomes rather difficult to learn a new alphabet. Much easier to listen to a language and pick up speaking it than it is to learn the alphabet of a new language, because then you have to put these letters together. And I tried to do that. And then right next to me would be an English book whose two pages I could finish in the time it took me to stitch a word together here, you know, and a word I didn't understand on top of that. And so I often gave up. And that happened for several years. And I went to college. <clears throat> I studied mathematics. So Bendre was never part of uh, my horizon even, you know, forget being with me. And uh, then, Eventually, it happened that uh, about 10 or so years ago, I made a breakthrough with the Kannada alphabet. You know, I mean, I used a dictionary, I wrote out stuff and got to a point where I could read Kannada reasonably, not fluently, but I wasn't stymied by it. And so I could start reading stuff. And I, for the first book I read happened to be a book of contemporary 20th century Kannada poetry, a collection of that, which included Bendre's poems, as well as a number of other well-known poets, K.S. Narsim Swami, Kuempu, Putina, Gokak, and all of them. And uh, around the same time, I was given a book by a family friend called Bendre Andre. And that was really one of uh, the sparks that uh, <clears throat> lit the fire that came to be my work on Bendre. Uh, I, read all of those essays really. It was a collection of different writings about Bendre. And at that time, as a primarily an English speaker who thought in English, I was writing stuff of my own, mostly poetry. And I was looking to read Kannada. And this was one of those books or the book that I was reading. And the stuff I read about Bendre was fascinating. You know, I mean, they said all of the stuff that Deepa just said. They talked about how he was a Varakavi. They talked about what he could do with words. And here and there, those essays contained excerpts from his work. And so I was engaging with his poetry, or rather I was reading about his poetry and not his poetry directly, you know, because I was in no position to read it. We'll come to that later. But he wrote in a register of Kannada, I prefer to call it, rather than a dialect, which was a Dharwad register of Kannada. And it wasn't familiar to me. I hadn't grown up speaking it. And so as a consequence, I got to this point where I became a devotee of Bendre's personality as much as his poetry, because so much had been written about him. There's so many interesting stories that tens or maybe even a few hundred people have told about him. You know, he was a living legend, really. Everywhere he went, he was sort of the hero of all of these sabhas where he recited his poetry. You know, he was known for being a Garudiga. That uh, scene that you saw uh, in the film where he's with a snake chama, Masti would call him a snake chama. He would call Bendre a Garudiga because of how he recited his poetry. And Bendre would then go on to write a poem titled Garudiga where he sort of 
uh, assesses his own poetry and what it means to be a Garudiga. But to come back uh, to what I was saying, I sort of was fascinated by his personality and took a pride in his poetry. And my own English poetry was definitely influenced by what I was reading about Bendre and all of that because it's a whole different uh, idea almost. You know, I mean, the idea of bhava and rasa and all that, you don't come across when you're reading English poetry, especially, let's say, contemporary English poetry. And so those new ideas were making their way into my poetry. And uh, my first attempt at translating Bendre came through this documentary, actually. I had been reading about him, uh, writing my own work, uh, my own poems mostly, and then I came across this documentary where he reads his own poem out, right? Nano. And so I had a laya, a rhythm to work with. And I thought, why not? You know, let's see what I can make of this poem. It wasn't a particularly nada filled poem, a euphony filled poem like a lot of his poems are. And I looked to see what I could do with it on a whim almost. You know, I hadn't contemplated becoming a translator of his poetry. But uh, using this laya, I came up with a translation that's included in the book and showed it to a few people and they were appreciative enough. But like I said, it was done on a whim and I didn't expect to take it any further. But then I must mention somebody named, who I call Sunat Kaka and his name is uh, Sudhinder Deshpande and he lives in Dharwad. We've never met even five years since I got to know him. But he has been writing about Bendre's poems for about 15 or 20 years. He must have been thinking about them for longer, but he began a blog where he used to write these explications of Bendre's poems. And I came across that blog and I read several of them. And one of the poems he'd written an excellent, a magnificent explication of was Ganga Avatarana. You must have heard of it, some of you, it's better known as Iliduba Tai Iliduba. The title is Gangavatarana. And uh, I just had listened to Kaling Rao sing it. Like uh, Deepa said, the Bhava Gita tradition in Karnataka has really done a lot to promote Bendre's poetry as well as other people's poetry. Serious poetry set to song is how most of us, Deepa included, I imagine, first came across such poetry. And so when I tried to, or when I read Kaka's explanation of Ganga Tarana, explication of Yakhyana, I thought to myself that I'd just see what it was like to translate those first six lines, you know. Ilidu bata, ilidu ba, harana jade in the hari, adi in the rushia, tore in the nusuliba, deva deva no tanisiba, dig diganta deli hanisiba, chara 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 galige unisiba, ilidu bata, ilidu ba. I thought I'd see what it was like. And I came up with the rhythm again. And then there was a second stanza that was harder. Ninage poda maduve, an entirely new word to me. Ninage poda maduve, ninna nudu todove, eke ede tadeve suriduba, swarga toreduba, bayala jareduba, nela di hariduba, ba rebata iduba. And okay, I tried my hand at it again with the help of Kaka's explication. And it progressed. I mean, absolutely wonderfully euphonic poem, you know, I mean, brimming with nada, you know, stuff like Kanchu minchagi taraliba, niru niragi uruliba, matte hode marali horaliba, da era da deena hare ali da heena neera da meena kare kare veba, elido bata, elido ba. I mean, it, you don't need to understand it almost to be able to appreciate it. And then there's this one portion, which Kalingraya has sung absolutely wonderfully, set it to music. Sura swapna vidda prati bimba vidda udbuddha shuddha nire etchettu edda akasha duddha dhare gilia lidda dhire siri vari jata vara pari jata tara kusuma dinde vrundara vandye mandara gandhe nine tai tande rasapura janye nina lanye sachida nanda kanye Bandare bare vandare sare kandhare tadevare ne avatara vende endare tai adha pata vanne i adha pata vanne So this is full of internal rhyme and all that. I'm sorry there isn't a screen for you to see the words and I'm going too fast but 
I think you could tell. For one thing, it's more Sanskrit uh, uh, filled than the rest of the poem. And it's full of all of these images that are very cultural almost to this land, right? I mean, he's calling on the Ganga to come down. And somehow or the other, using Kaka's translate explication, I went ahead and translated this. You know, I mean, I included it in the book and you'll have to may decide for yourselves what you think of it. But it was really translating this portion, you know. Maybe I'll read it out a bit of it later. But it was this translation, translating that portion particularly, because in comparison to that portion, everything else was easy enough and I finished the whole poem. But this served as a catalyst really for my deep engagement with Bendre and like I say, it sort of opened the floodgates. I think I translated about 10 or 15 poems over three or four months. I went to Sadhana Keri, where Bendre used to live and met his son, uh, Vamara Bendre, uh, a few months actually uh, before he passed, or maybe a year or so. Gave him some of my translations and uh, then began a website, a blog, Dara Bendre in English, where I began to put my poems up. And so, yeah, I mean, I come from a background that had no Bendre to one that now is Bendre Maya, filled with Bendre, more or less. Um, I understand you are mesmerized by Bendre. Even Vaman Bendre couldn't resist Bendre. Vaman Bendre is Bendre's son, and uh, in the later years of his uh, Bendre's life, Vaman Bendre was his writer too. I had a chance to meet Vaman Bendre like uh, Madhav on a different occasion, on a different assignment. And uh, Vaman Bendre couldn't stop talking about his father. Um, he, he, he narrated many uh, occasions. Uh, apparently there was a calling bell uh, which was in Vaman Bendre's room and Bendre at all odd hours, like 1 a.m., he would ring the bell and ask Vaman Bendre to come. And Vaman Bendre kept a job. So Vaman Bendre used to say, from 1 to 7.30, I was his scribe. And at 7.30, I had to get ready and leave for my job. So that was the kind of uh, investment that Bendre, or passion with which uh, Bendre worked. And, and it's known to write poems because he dreamed of a line. Right, right. That's why he wanted right. it to be written down. Yes. And um, so it's hard to escape uh, Bendre. Who can escape lines like Belu Dingala Nuda, Danakara Dakalina, Dhuli Sanjaya, Huli, Mugila Muttyada, or Mugila Marige, Ragaratiya, Nanjaye Rita, Ka Sanjaya Gita. So it's really hard to escape the magic of uh, Bendre's Nada. But to make this leap as a translator is something else. You know, um, I think many people who have loved Bendre's poems at some point in their lives have attempted a translation, uh, which includes me also. But when you look at it, you just feel, okay, now let me not, you know, uh, do it anymore. So, Madhav, uh, how did you go ahead? Uh, what gave you the confidence or what kind of relationship did you establish with Bendre? See, it's um, just as a, if you were just a translator, uh, you wouldn't have perhaps had this courage to translate Bendre. You could, I, I'm sure you established a different kind of a relationship with this writer uh, for you to be able to translate him. Can you talk about that, Madhav? Yeah, I'll try to because, uh, I mean, people have said that uh, I have some sort of a, Kaka said the Antarika Sammanda Ide with Bendre, you have that. And I told Kaka the same thing, that you have that too. And Bendre brought us together. And so, yes. Actually, uh, in Dharwad itself, or in the Kannada literary circles, there's this thing about Bendre always, that Bendre can have a debilitating effect on you, that you can stop being a writer. So many writers have, uh, in Dharwad, say that, unless in the best sense of the word, you do Pitru Hatya, you can't write. <laughs> you can't write. That's the kind of effect Bendre has on you. And many writers have come away from Bendre's that close quarters to be able to write. So, uh, just include this while you're talking. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, 
past, the most famous example of that is Gopal Krishna Agadiga, who says himself that he stopped writing poetry for about two years in order to find a new path that allowed him to be different from Bendre. You know, it was almost impossible. Uh, I think, like Deepa said, you, I mean, you are surrounded by that Nada and Nada is, I've translated it as euphony, you know, I mean, there's so much and so it, I took time to figure out what best to call it, sound, uh, word sound, euphony. And like Deepa said also, I remember I went to a function at uh, Ranga Shankara uh, in 2016 and uh, Karnad was still around and he came and talked about his experience. And one of the things he said was that Bendre Yava Kavyan no Bedaslila. He didn't create any poets, you know, any new poets. And uh, one of the things he said was that because somebody would come by, a 16, you know, 17 year old boy, boy was interested in poetry would come by. And this was. Bendre in his 60s and 70s, and he tell that fellow, now go read that Samaveda Shloka and now write a poem about it, you know. And all he was looking to do was write a love poem or something at that time. And so there was really no connection and that was what Karnad's sort of objection was. Having thought about that in the days uh, <clears throat> since he said it, I do think that uh, his influence was absolutely <coughs> uh, everywhere, not just in Dharwad, but outside of it too. Uh, but uh, one thing that he did do, I think he did help writers create some sort of a ground for themselves by being different from him, but also by trying to uh, follow in his footsteps. Like uh, Somshekar Imrapur, for instance, is uh, somebody who was considered Bendre, not heir, but somebody who picked up Bendre's task of writing in uh, the Dharwad uh, register. But what he particularly did, I think, Bendre was create three of Kannada's greatest critics of the 20th century, Kirtanath Kurtkoti, Shankar Mukashi Punekar, and G.S. Amur, you know. And uh, I mentioned those names because Shankar Mukashi is especially close to me. I consider him a uh, guru in the sense that he taught me what it meant to be a rasika. You know, again, a word that I picked up only because I began to engage with Bendre and his poetry, you know. It doesn't translate exactly to connoisseur. It translates to more than that. It, there's a rasa behind it, you know. I mean, again, uh, Indian poetics, if you want to call it that. And he taught me what it was like to be a rasika of Bendre's poetry because of some of his wonderful essays, you know. I mean, he has these minchin matu, they say, you know. I mean, these uh, flashes. flashes of insight where he says something that nobody else has said. He didn't engage with Bendre as much as Kurtkoti or Amur, but I think he wrote some of the best essays about Bendre's poetry and best appreciations of Bendre's poetry that have been written and they were extremely influential in helping me become a rasika of Bendre's poetry and understanding it uh, in that sense of just the rasa. As for uh, the relationship I developed, I'd say that looking back those one or two years or thereabouts where I engaged with writings about Bendre and snippets of Bendre's poetry and began to sort of feel a hemme, a pride in Bendre and that he was a Kannada writer and that he did all of this and I was coming across this sort of, uh, <clears throat> like you say, man who was not of this world almost. That allowed me to and the fact that I didn't have a background of having studied Bendra in the sixth standard or mugged up a poem of his and let it be at that. Uh, I think all of those helped me establish a different kind of relationship with Bendra than perhaps most people had. People who went to Kannada medium schools or studied Kannada in school would likely have come across a poem or two of his or a Bhava Gita, several Bhava Gita's and they would have stopped at that. On the other hand, my engagement Actually, though I say it began after 2000, uh, uh, or I mean after I finished college and began to try to read Kannada, one incident stands out and I've talked about it. I listened to this poem called Karadi Kunita, The Dance of the Bear, which I've translated. And it's been sung by B.R. Chaya very nicely. Uh, and I didn't understand most of it. It's, been, it's written in this Dharwad register and it's been sung very quickly, and so I didn't get most of it. But I do remember this portion, 
ತ್ರೇತಾಯುಗ ರಾಮನ್ನ ದ್ವಾಪರದ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ನ ಕಲಿಯುಗದ ಕಲ್ಕಿನ ಕಂಡಾನ ಜಾಂಬೂ ನದಿ ದಂಡೆಯ ಜಂಬೂ ನೀರಲ ಹಣ್ಣು ಕೃತಯುಗ ಕೃತಯುಗದ ಕೊನೆಗೀವ ಉಂಡಾನ ಬಟ್ ದೋಸ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೂ ಲೈನ್ಸ್ ರೈಟ್ ತ್ರೇತಾಯುಗ ರಾಮನ್ನ ದ್ವಾಪರದ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ನ ಕಲಿಯುಗದ ಕಲ್ಕಿನ ಕಂಡಾನ ದೋಸ್ ಸ್ಟೇಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೀ ಪಹಾಪ್ಸ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಐ ಡಿಂಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಪೋಯಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಐ ಗಾಟ್ ಬಟ್ ದ ವಾಟ್ ಹಿ ಡಿಡ್ ವಿತ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ರೈಟ್ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಈಸ್ ಕ್ರಾಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಏಜಸ್ ಇನ್ ಟೂ ಲೈನ್ಸ್ ತ್ರೇತಾಯುಗ ರಾಮನ್ನ ದ್ವಾಪರದ ಕೃಷ್ಣನ್ನ ಕಲಿಯುಗದ ಕಲ್ಕಿನ ಕಂಡಾನ ವಿಚ್ I have translated as this bear it seen Rama and the Treta age, Dwaparas, Krishna and Kali's Kalki he had seen. As the Krita age drew to a close, he fed on the Jambu fruit by the river gleaned. So I, that stayed with me and I was reminded of it when I began to engage with Bendre and read about him. And I think in some ways I served an apprenticeship almost, you know, Deepa, because I read about him. and didn't go straight to nakutanti like a lot of us do because that's what one in the nyanapita award and most people who go to nakutanti are bewildered by it and don't understand what he's saying and put it aside you know and listen to a few more bhava geetas of his and let it be but that wasn't the case with me i found <coughs> was lucky enough to find uh, sunath kaka's blog I was lucky enough to find these writings by uh, shankar mukashi uh, and uh, but at the end of it all when i think about it bendre in his sakhi geeta famous narrative poem of his talks about his wife and calls her vidhi tanda vadhu neenu you know the bride that destiny of fate has brought to me and in my case bendre is vidhi tanda kavi you know i really can't think of anything else you know he really destiny brought us together in and uh, my engagement with him after that took on a form of uh, appreciation and also an understanding the uh, like you said some most people will have wanted to translate him simply because that sort of active an active engagement and i think i wanted that since i was writing my own poetry in english i wanted something active after having read so much about him and his poetry i wanted to actively engage with him now and translation seemed the best way i had no sort of background in it uh, really i had studied it formally that is I, what is what i mean and so in some ways uh, bhanda dhairya is what perhaps took me forward you know i mean uh, uh, sort of what you'd call full hardiness perhaps something that perhaps people who knew of bendre's teacher would have uh, would have made or wouldn't have done because they would have hesitated to translate somebody like him but i didn't do any of that i didn't start with nakutanti i started with poems that i had listened to you know i mean i can't stress this enough i came to bendre not through a book but through my ears you know not th- through my eyes but through my ears that's how bendre first <coughs> came to me you know through my ears and that helped me set a or create a lot of my own rhythms in the poems that i've translated came from the songs i was trying to replicate those rhythms that i'd enjoyed because they've been tuned by several different people but most of them are wonderful tunes and i was looking to recreate them and all of these together i think uh, made my engagement deep you know allowed it to become something deep and then i sustained the effort because like you say he was just so mesmerizing and you find out that he's written every kind of poetry right so actually that's interesting because bendre himself says wodu gabba hadu gabba poetry that you read poetry that you listen to much as we think that bendre is some kind of a wizard who could spin words like uh, you know magically um he himself in his poems talks about the difficulties of the creative process for instance the way he plays with the word nada nada beku nada beku nada na nada beku nada in kannada is not just resonance euphony as madhav has translated nada is also to need you need the dough so bendre says you have to need you have to need you have to need and you know extract the resonance so and then he says um enna paade na girali kallu sakkare sihi nina girali isn't it so he says um you leave the woes to me the poet you just enjoy the song so bendre doesn't never you know um kind of diminish the the struggles of the creative process much 
as we think that it came to him very effortlessly. Mendre repeatedly talks about the churning, nadodu, these kind of uh, things. Madhav, do you want to read a poem? Yeah, okay. Uh, speaking of uh, this nada beku, nada beku, nada na nada beku, right? And I've tried to translate portions of Bendre's poems which aren't fully translatable into English. And for this one, nada beku, nada beku is we need euphony, we need euphony, and then it happens that need and need are pronounced the same way, right? N e e d and k n e a d. But the difference between English and Kannada is sort of very stark right there. Kannada, being a phonetic language like other Indian languages, is able to use the same word with the same spelling to talk about two matters, nada as in euphony and uh, nada as in need. Whereas when I wrote, we need to need euphony, you write N-E-E-D and then you write K-N-E-A-D and it's different, you know, I mean, it doesn't give you the same sense and I've thought a lot about that, especially because our languages and Kannada in particular, because that's what I've engaged with, engaged with is so, I mean, phonetic, right? And so we can say so many things that don't make sense or aren't translatable. You talk, I'm sure it's in every language, but in Kannada you talk about, uh, Bendra says, chumu chumu nasu kinali, you know, and chumu chumu is, I mean, it doesn't make very much sense outside of Kannada in that sense. And I'm sure there's something in Hindi or Bengali or uh, <clears throat> any other language, Tamil, that indicates that sort of uh, uh, Onomatopoeia, yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, you said if I want, you asked if I wanted to read some poems, and uh, I don't know that I have that nada uh, because I haven't translated that. So I I can I think recite it first. Nada beku, nada beku, nada na nada beku, nada ka prati nada beku, nada na ada miala, nada na ada miala, bere ke wada beku, nada beku. So this is the first, and it goes on for quite a long time actually, it's one of his longer poems, but this is the first stanza and I remember it again because it was sung very nicely and tuned to music. One thing I should mention here is that most of these songs unfortunately don't sing or aren't the whole poem, you know, and sometimes that's a problem because people believe what they listen to is the entire poem and it can get problematic when Stanzas that are left out are integral to the poem itself. But uh, maybe for now I'll try to read out uh, maybe Nanu and my translation of that since that was the very first one. I'll read out, I mean you listen to Bendra, you cite it. I'll try to recite it myself and then read out the English uh, Actually, translation. It has a QR code and if you scan the QR code you can see, you can hear the recitation. That was only, yeah, it had to do with the fact that Bendre has to be listened to, you know, I mean, I could think of no other way. Bendre recited his poems and this is the only way to get some audio in and we have the luxury now of using QR codes. Use, there used to be CDs at the back of a book uh, earlier and so that's what uh, I've done. And I've uh, done it myself because, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think Bendre had a wonderful voice but he had no sankocha, he was not uh, shy about uh, speaking to an audience or reciting his poetry and so I took my cue from him and didn't worry about how good my voice was but went ahead and, and recited these myself. So, Nanu. Vishwamateya garbha kamala jata paraga paramanu kirti nanu. Bhumitaya maya hidimanna gudigatti nintantha murti nanu. Bharata mateya koti kartikotsavadalli minugutiya jyoti nanu. Kannada da tai tavareya parimada undu birutiha gali nanu. Nanna taiya halu netarava kudidantha jivanta mamate nanu. 
ಈ ಐದು ಐದೇಯರೇ ಪಂಚ ಪ್ರಾಣಗಳಾಗಿ ಈ ಜೀವ ದೇಹ ನಿಹನು ಹೃದಯಾರವಿಂದದಲ್ಲಿರುವ ನಾರಾಯಣನೇ ತಾನಾಗಿ ದತ್ತ ನರನು ವಿಶ್ವದೊಳನುಡಿಯಾಗಿ ಕನ್ನಡಿಸುತ್ತಿಹ ನಿಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂಬಿಕಾ ತನಯನಿವನು ಬೇಂದ್ರೆ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಅಂಬಿಕಾ ತನಯ ಇಂಥವನು ನಾನು ಇವನು ಕವಿ ಬಟ್ ದ ಪೋಯಮ್ ಎಂಡ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ವಿಶ್ವದೊಳನುಡಿಯಾಗಿ ಕನ್ನಡಿಸುತ್ತಿಹ ನಿಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂಬಿಕಾ ತನಯನಿವನು ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಇಂಡಿವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ಪೊಲಿನಿಕ್ ಗ್ಲೋರಿ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕಾಸ್ಮಿಕ್ ಮದರ್ಸ್ ಲೋಟಸ್ ವೋಂಬ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಅಪ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಐಡಲ್ ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅ ಫಿಸ್ಟ್ ಫುಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಅರ್ತ್ ಮದರ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಲೇ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಸಿಂಟ್ಲೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಲೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಮಿಲಿಯನ್ ದೀಪಾವಳೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮದ ಭಾರತಿ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಔಟ್ ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಡಿಂಗ್ ವಿಂಡ್ ಫೆಡ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಫ್ರೇಗ್ರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕನ್ನಡಾಸ್ ಮದ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಆನಿಮೆಟ್ ಕಂಪ್ಯಾಷನ್ ಡ್ರಂಕ್ ದ ಮಿಲ್ಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ಲಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈನ್ ಓನ್ ಮದ ದೀಸ್ ಫೈವ್ ಮದರ್ಸ್ ಮೇಕ್ ಅಪ್ ದ ವೈಟಲ್ ಲೇಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬ್ರೀದಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರೇಮ್ the narayana of the lotus heart has himself turned into the mortal datta as ambika tanaya he mirrors here in kannada the universe is in our voice <laughs> this one necessarily involved a uh, uh, inability to translate the pun kannadi suttihanilli kannadi is mirror in kannada and kannadi su means to make kannada to kannadify something but also to mirror something and so i said he mirrors here in kannada because that seemed to be the only way to do it there's no equivalent in english so should i perhaps uh, like i said uh, i given up being shy long ago so i'll <laughs> sing a song uh, which also you find in the book this is baro sadhana kerige which is very well known you keep that okay sure so then any um, yeah. what should one thing i think that worth mentioning is uh, i was talking about the rasika and deepa was talking about how bendre looked at the creative process and uh, almost introspected he wrote a number of poems about the creative process itself and it's from a translation of one of the lines of that poem that this uh, talks <clears throat> title comes the churn and churning of the world we'll get to that later but i mentioned that because bendre was a poet who was the very opposite of an ivory tower poet he was amongst people all the time he wanted them and everything to do with them you know i believe there's a story where some man and his wife were quarreling and uh, he'd uh, they he found out about it bendre and so he met him in the market and began to sort of give him some advice and tell him that you shouldn't do this and all of that you know and the man said ni hogre nan mane aaki nan mane olle anta so he said fine but as soon nam horgade kelsad alva adike adu nam jawabdari kuda agutte you know so he wanted to be involved you, you keep so long as i mean i can't hear it it's okay but you make it a public matter and then i'm going to come in kind of thing and so he was not to quarrel he was jagala ganta as they call it you know quarrelsome man he used to quarrel as much as he could almost you know i mean he quarreled about everything uh, he used to quarrel publicly more publicly than privately i believe but i say this because you don't think of poets being that you think of them writing in their spare time perhaps of observing the world and then the coming back to i don't know not their ivory tower but their houses and needing the quiet of a space and all that you have writers workshops and all that nowadays where they get together and give each other ideas and all that all bendre wanted was talk you know matu and uh, i read an article i think a year or two ago on his birth anniversary where uh, sidlingaya patan shetty who knew him uh, is that sidlinga Siddhinga Patan Shetty, who is also a poet and who grew up in Dharwad and New Bendre, he says that all he did was Matu, you know, I don't, he says, I don't think any Kavi in the world has talked as much as he did. It didn't matter what kind of talk it was, he just talked, talked and talked. They went on a bus ride somewhere apparently to some sort of function and the whole ride Bendre was monologuing <laughs> and nothing else, you know, I mean, nobody else could get a word in Edgeware. I think they used to try and they'd give up, you know, because he would go on and on and he'd talk about everything he could. and eventually they he was sort of the older man he was the oldest of the group and so they just stop uh, trying to say anything and listen to him and i say that because he was sort of brimming with this uh, humanness 
even as he accessed something higher and mokashi punekar understood that in some ways he distinguishes between bendre and ambika tanaya datta something that bendre himself used to do right i mean there is this uh, i remember i think kamba wrote an essay and is that's where i found he said that bendre used to go up on stage and then he say that uh, bendre e mahakavi ambika tanaya dattanige bendre inda saavirada namaskara namaskara galu you know bendre salutes this great poet ambika tanaya datta because there were two different people or beings in his estimation this is the shakti the poetic shakti and he was bendre who was the lipikara you find something similar in uh, kalidasa. kalidasa and also i think uh, kumar vyasa right i mean gadugina bharata which is a well known kannada class, uh, classic he says veera veera narayanane bardiddu anta nanu lipikara anta and so bendre felt that way and this ambika tanayadatta was almost an ankita nama in the sense of the bhakti poets he was a bhakti poet he was attached or he felt an affinity for the bhakti poets much more than he did for i think the more laukika poets you know like pampa and all of them he appreciated them but i think he liked the bhakti poets he was one of his favorites was kanakadasa and of course he liked the uh, nadalola nature of uh, lakshmisha and um, everybody else too uh, that he engaged with but uh, my point is that this rasika engagement he actually maybe the i mean i don't know which my guess that i don't think any major poet has talked as much about the rasika as bendre has he keeps addressing the rasika and there's one poem here which is called uh, uh, you know what's it what what it's called just give me a minute uh, hard a hurulu which is basically kavi rasika kavi it's a conversation and in this what he's saying the 21st poem in the book what he's saying is that they're having a dialogue and the kavi is saying that without the rasika there is no poetry so this dialogue is central to poetry he needs the rasika to be able to write his poetry and the rasika sort of gives back to him enna paad enna girali adara haadanna ashte needuvenu ninage rasika ಕಲ್ಲು ಸಕ್ಕರೆ ಅಂತ ಹಾಂ ಓಕೆ ಸೊ ನಿನ್ನೆದೆಯು ಕರಗಿದರೆ ಆ ಸವಿಯು ಹಣಿಸು ನನಗೆ ಗಿವ್ ದಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಟು ಮಿ ಐ ಗಿವ್ ಯು ಎನ್ನ ಪಾಡ್ ಎನಗಿರಲಿ ಲೆಟ್ ಮೈ ಟ್ರಬಲ್ಸ್ ಬಿ ಮೈ ಓನ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಗಿವ್ ಯು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ದೇರ್ ಸಾಂಗ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ಬೇಂದ್ರೆ ಇಸ್ ಸೇಯಿಂಗ್ ಸೊ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ವೇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಡೈಲಾಗ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ರಸಿಕಾ ಹಿ ವಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ದ ರಸಿಕಾ ಬಾ ಹತ್ತರಕ್ಕೆ ನನ್ನ ಎತ್ತರಕ್ಕೆ ನಿನ್ನ ಎತ್ತರಕ್ಕೆ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೋತ್ತರಕ್ಕೆ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಹಿ ಸೆಸ್ ಯು ನೋ ಐ ಮೀನ್ ಹೀಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಈಕ್ವಲ್ ದ ಪೋಯಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ರಸಿಕಾ ಆರ್ ಈಕ್ವಲ್ ವಿದೌಟ್ ದ ರಸಿಕಾ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಪೋಯಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ರಸಿಕಾ ಟು ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಸ್ ದ ಪೋಯಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫಾರ್ತ್ ಫ್ಯಾಷನ್ ದಟ್ ಕೀಪ್ಸ್ ಪೋಯಟ್ರಿ ಅಲೈವ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯಾ ಅಲೈವ್ ಬೇಸಿಕ್ಲಿ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಹೌ ಪೋಯಟ್ರಿ ಇಸ್ ಕೆಪ್ಟ್ ಅಲೈವ್ two three things mother one is uh, this whole uh, modern idea about the poet needs his private space which was so untrue of bendre's life he was living amidst chaos and wrote amidst chaos so was uh, so was it with uh, narsim swami the house was full of children and pro- apparently narsim swami had no space to sit and write he would sit in the corner of a room amidst all the din and commotion and write his uh, poems and this thing about uh, bhakti i think in some ways bhakti and folk uh, kind of meet in uh, bendre uh, this primacy of emotion uh, though bendre was a scholar very well read this um, you know he could yoke together this intellect and emotion in such a wonderful way that it comes so close to folk and his language was also oh very tr- very native to dharwad right. yeah so what i want to ask you um, madhav is that uh, uh, with bendra you can just be lost in nada and you don't even have to make an effort to understand the poem uh, so you can stay with the, the joy of listening how the words play out for you and stuff but as a translator it can't be like that as a translator you have to understand the meaning of the poem one is the primary challenge is to 
you know, to deal with onomatopoeia, which Bendre, you know, is uh, very central to Bendre's uh, poetic genius. The other thing is that he was writing in uh, uh, Dharwad Kannada, and it was layered with uh, meaning. For instance, uh, a song like um, Tum 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 Bhi Bandita, you can enjoy the song, you can think it's uh, about light and darkness and death and everything and forget the song. But Bendre is beyond uh, sound, beyond the play of words and the meaning is, forms a very intense part of uh, Bendre's poet, poetry. This movement from a seemingly uh, simple, playful exterior to something very dense, to something very loaded, that interior, that journey is very difficult for a translator. Um, because, uh, huh, can you talk about that journey, Madhav? How did you get to the interior from the exterior? For an English reader who has no idea about the Kannada, um, it can be completely lost in uh, translation. But um, for you as a translator, it may have been a very important question. While you retain the play of words, you should also hold on to the meaning of the poem. Uh, how did you work on this? Can you give us an example and tell us how you achieved it? Sure. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question, Deepa, and also some excellent points. Uh, onomatopoeia, apparently it's pronounced on a matopia or something, but it's not an onomatopic word, right? And so the point is, uh, you could, I can, can pronounce it anyway, I suppose. But uh, by onomatopia, <coughs> I was discussing it already. Things like chumu chumu nasukinali, or uh, he's what he says. Or then, for instance, uh, in Karadi Kunita, uh, he says, Kuniale maganeni annodan detada. Kuniale Maganeni Annodan De Tada Tanana Tanana Tandana Muddu Kusina Hage Musumusu Madutta Kunidana Kunitava Chandana. So Tanana Tanana Tandana is just a line there. And I mean, we're hardly going to be able to find an English equivalent for it. We know that it's meant to indicate some sort of dance. You know, I mean, you have Takadimi, Tanana, all of those are part of the Indian tradition, the classical tradition, Tirakitatom, all of those kinds of things. So he's basically done that. He's used, he's been able to create this phonetic sound because Kannada allows for it. Indian languages, phonetic languages allow for it. So when it came to, for instance, translating this poem especially, I went ahead and retained it simply because it worked out, you know. Kuniale maganeni anadun de tada tana natana natandana mudduku sinahanga musumusu madutta kunidana kunita vachandana musumusu. That's another onomatopic uh, virukti, uh, repeat of the same word. And so, dance your rascal dance, he says, tanana tanana tandana, he plays, sniff sniff snuff snuff, dances the bear, what a lovely dance, I'll say. So I've retained tannana, 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 he plays. Simply because there was no equivalent that I could find that worked. And also because it worked with the rhythm I had given the poem. But there are other matters, like you say, where you need to keep the meaning in mind. And sometimes you might have to give up uh, the onomatopoeia as a consequence. There's one poem I'd like to read out, and before I read that out, uh, to pick up what uh, Deepa was saying, Bendre's use of Dharwad Kannada was completely unprecedented, you know? To use what is generally called a dialect or a register to write high lyric poetry, serious lyric poetry, had never been done and is usually not done in languages that have a history like Kannada. You know, I mean, a thousand year old classical history that is mostly full of Sanskrit, you know. There was a lot of Kannada too, but mostly full of that. 
the folk tradition that <coughs> Bendre drew from and made him be called a folk poet actually, because superficially that's what he was, is very different and was not considered literary. But Bendre almost single-handedly made that the acceptable way of creating poetry or an, acceptab an, an, an acceptable way of creating poetry. And while I've tried, I've thought about how to translate uh, this register, you know, because English doesn't have a history of folk music that is completely different as far as I know. And also doesn't, in the 20th century, for instance, when Bende wrote, it didn't have something like Cockney poetry that was serious, you know, using Cockney rhyming slang or something and creating serious poetry, which is a dialect of English or Northumberland or any Yorkshire English, something like that. You weren't creating serious poetry with that. And so to grapple with that, I grappled with it for as long as I could, let's say, and I thought of ways to keep the folk or the essence of its rustic essence as much as possible. But eventually there was a compromise that had to be reached where I used regular English, standard English, simply because such experiments don't have the history of English literature to back them up, you know. And so while it may have been new perhaps or if I'd used Cockney slang or something like that, which I'd have had to learn in the first place, then I don't it wouldn't have got that ghanate, you know, it wouldn't have got the gravity that this poetry deserves. And so here's an example called Nagi Navilu, and it's a wonderful example of Vendra using the spoken language. And I came across this uh, song tuned by Mysore and Swami, and I'm going to sing the song first and then read out the translation. Nari ninna mari myaga Nagi Navilu aadatitta Aadatitta odatitta mugila kadege noodatitta mina 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 mincha titta mooda titta mulaga titta mulaga titta tholaga titta nela jala bedaga titta kanni nyaga banna da nota taka taka kuni daada titta kuni titta maani titta ona pile ona daada titta. Manada ma marada konige, koki londu kuda titta, kuda titta harda bitu, bare ninna noda titta, ondu jiva nondu kondu, hagali rolo midukada titta, miduka titta todaka titta, eno ondu puduka titta, kaniri na malaya kuda. Tanna dukha toda titta, toda titta beda titta, doraka dakka baada titta. This is how the poem goes, right? And this nari ninna mari myaga. For instance, the first thing I had to get used to was mari means face on that side, you know. It's completely different here. It means some sort of a bhuta in this part of Karnataka, whereas there it means just a face, you know, the face. And uh, then this itta itta, you would say ittu in this side, but he uses that so wonderfully, right? Mari ninna nari myaga nagi navila aada titta, oda titta, mooda titta, tholaga titta, belaga titta. And so I remember trying to come up with something for this and it struck me that I could try to keep a A, B, C, B kind of rhyme scheme four lines and that's how the po poem progresses but it has an A, B, B, B scheme if you want to call it that, you know, I mean A and then Titta, Titta is what gives it that. And after I translated it, I found that I had done something that was equivalent to it, so I'll recite it first. The peacock smile itself or Nagi <clears throat> uh, maybe laugh but I use smile, but that itself is such an interest, uh, interesting metaphor, you know, I mean, such, something so new. Nari nina mari myaga nagi navala aada titta, you know. 
Woman upon your lips, did play a peacock smile, did play a smile, did flee a smile, did it look cloudward the while, a flash, a flash, a flash the smile, did rise the smile, did fall the smile, did fall the smile, did glow the smile, did the land and waters gleam the while, within your eyes the colored gaze, did dance, takadimi dance, did dance and prance, did droop and fade, did play coquette at every chance. On the tip of the mango tree of the mind, did sit a coil all alone, did sit and never sing a note, did gaze on you with look forlorn. A living life was suffering, did wail all through the day and night. Did wail all through, did flail all through, did search for something with its might. With the rain of tears too, did it pour forth its woe, did pour its woe, did plead its case, did wilt when no response did show, is the translation. And like I said, what I came to realize after I had finished it was the did, did, did equated the titta, titta, itta, itta, itta. In a way, I hadn't intend, intended it to, but it almost exactly corresponded to that. And this is an example where did play, did flee a smile. It's a slightly antiquated use of the English language, let's say, a slightly different. You won't find it in modern contemporary poetry because it's not what you'd write nowadays. It's not contemporary speech. So that was an attempt. Uh, and I retained, instead of taka taka kuni daada titta, I said did dance taka dimi dance. I used taka dimi because it sounded nicer than taka taka, but also because it gives the line did dance taka dimi dance. So D, it's a sort of reading, it, the, the, the da sound, even though it's da and the, there's a certain uh, equivalence all through uh, the line. But uh, to talk about Tumbi Banditu, because that's really something I enjoyed doing and uh, is also an example of a, the poem's true untranslatability, if uh, you can say that. So Tumbi Banditu starts with a refrain that is repeated at the end of each of its three stanzas. And the refrain is pure sound. Tum, 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 banditta, tangi tum, banditu is how the refrain goes, right? And by itself, it means nothing really. It only takes on meaning when it reaches or is used again at the end of the first stanza and then takes on a different meaning at the end of the second stanza and then another meaning at the end of the third stanza. And so I didn't try to translate that because it didn't seem possible in a way that integrated it with the rest of the poem's translation. But I did try to translate it when it reached or when it appeared at the end of each stanza. And so I'll just read the first stanza out and read my translation too. Tum 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 bi banditta tangi tum bi banditu Bedaki ginta, bella gaita, gali ginta, tella gaita. Bedaki ginta, bella gaita, gali ginta, tella gaita. Jadi indeli da gangi hanga, changane nege ditta. Mayola hirua, muli muli go moody banditta. Adi moody go di nado antella, mulogisi bititta. Tangi tumbi banditu, tum 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 bi banditta. Tangi tumbi banditu. It was more bright than light and slighter to the air. It was more bright than light and slighter to the air. It sprang like Gange did from the locks of Hara's hair. It rose in every nook and corner of the body's frame. It joined head and toe and center and flooded the mace the same. Sister, a fulfilled had it come. A full, a full, a full, a full, a fulfilled had it come. Sister, a fulfilled it had come. So that was my attempt at creating something equivalent. Tum, tum, a full. Two syllables trying to recreate that. Yeah, so this poem actually, um, while we think it's uh, something about light and everything else, um, this poem is actually Bendre's uh, conversation with the 12th century Vachanakaras. Bendre in this poem 
he takes the central idea from Allama's line, Belaki Nolagana Maha Belagu. And the whole poem is woven around that Maha Belagu. And it's his conversation. He's speaking, he's engaging from the 20th century and he says, your movement, what you did has filled me with the Chaitanya and I want to engage with you. And this Tum 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 Tumbi Bandita is his conversation with the 12th century Vachanakaras. So it's really not easy to understand uh, Bendriya at one go. The other thing that I think is uh, very important before we open it out uh, to the audience for questions and answers, um, I think the two, three things that one should um, speak about Bendre is his, uh, you know, the way he looked at women. In a Saki Gita, I think is an extraordinary um, poem and uh, no Kannada poet until then had given women this kind of agency, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, he calls his, he, he says, you're married, but she's, you shouldn't see her as hendati, you should not see her as wife, you should see her as your sakhi. So that's, that's something phenomenal uh, about Bendre. And the other thing is that how, um, before Bendre, uh, there was, temple was something very uh, central to all poetry in Kannada, but with uh, Bendre, Kuvampu, how it shifted, it shifted to nature. They were not uh, atheists, they were uh, believers, but everything shifted to nature. The priest was uh, replaced by the poet, uh, the temple was replaced by nature, and Shastra was replaced by Kavya. And Bendre, you know, his sweep, Hakki Haruti De Noditira, Baro Sadhana Kerike, he says, Nandana da Tunukondu Bidide. He says, a piece of heaven is here, is in Sadhana Keri, is where I live. So, the, no, you know, the sweep and range of Bendre is impossible to capture in one uh, conversation. And I feel, Madhav, you must do a thematic translation of Bendre in your future attempts. You should translate Saki Gita, you should translate poems like Baro Sadhana Keri Ke and others. Thank you so much, Madhav. I think we should open it out for questions. Thank you. I, um, thanks. I um, was first introduced to Sakhi Gitam at a uh, lecture that I attended. And I don't come from a Kannada family. But there was something about the poetry that really struck me. And uh, I know that you've just done a portion of Sakhi Gitam here. So my question is for somebody who's not very proficient in Kannada literature, where can I go to get more, uh, a good translation or a good rendering of Sakhi Gitam? Because I've not been able to find anything on the web. Okay, yeah. Uh, for one thing, it's actually been translated, uh, I've included or I've only translated the first of, it's a long narrative poem consisting of 40 cantos, if you want to call it that, and each of them is 24 lines long, so it's 960 lines in total. And it's been rendered in its entirety by K. Raghavendra Rao, uh, an Indian English poet who got to know Bendre, I think, towards the end of Bendre's life and engaged with his poetry, and particularly through translation. I haven't read the whole book myself, the whole of it, uh, even in the Kannada, for that matter, it's a long poem, so I've read several cantos, but not all of it. But I'd recommend that, because that's the only one I know of, too, that has looked to render the whole poem, Saki Gita, uh, into English. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. In response to Bhimre's uh, Saki Gita, Sumatindranadi wrote Dampati Gita, something very similar to Saki Gita. It's very inspired. Thank you. Uh, Madhu, you said your first. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, congratulations. Namge, Mysur Kannada Dorge, Yesto Padagar Arthwag and Lauro. Athra Yaro translate Madidara, Naro, the Harvard Kannada, then the Mysur Kannada Kath, my interpretation Madidara Yaro, Skagali. Bendre hard, uh, particularly Avu even and even Arasalpa, you Tumbu Tumbi Bandita Tumbachanag explained Madre, 
ದೀಪ ಅವರೇ ಆ ಥರ ಹಾವು ಈವಿನ ಏನಾದ್ರು ಒಂಚೂರು ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪ್ಲೇನ್ ಮಾಡೋಕ್ಕಾಗಿ ಅದು ತುಂಬ ಕಷ್ಟದ ಪದ್ಯ ಇನ್ನೊಂದೇ <laughs> and it he uses the word hedasu which is kind of a, a strength but also hardness and to describe what uh, the poems of nakutanti uh, are uh, like but the first stanza of this which has been sung and which he referred to uh, are from this poem nakutanti aavu ee vina naavu nivige anutana da tananana ನಾನು ನೀನ ಈ ನೀ ನಾನಿಗೆ ಬೇನೆ ಏನು ಜಾಣಿನ ಚಾರು ತಂತ್ರಿಯ ಚರಣ ಚರಣದ ಘನ ಘನ ಘನಗಣಿತ ಚತುರಸ್ವನ ಹತವೋ ಹಿತವೋ ಆನ ಹತ ಮಿತಿ ಮಿತಿಗೆ ಇತಿ ನನ್ನ ಬೆನ್ನಿ ನಾನಿಕೆ ಜನನ ಜಾನಿಕೆ ಮನನವೇ ಸಹಿತಸ್ತನ so yeah i, mean, I don't so tough i don't think it's meant to be translated right actually someone who has tried to understand this is one scholar who has pursued bendre for his entire life bendre krishnappa bendre krishnappa has brought out a book uh, in which he, he has uh, dealt with some poems of bendre and tried to understand them so you can uh, get some interpretation of this nakutanti poem Okay. in bendre krishna pa's work but i don't even think i feel that bendre was playing a trick on all of us <laughs> uh, this something it reminded me of sukumar ray's uh, nonsense poems abol tabol where it's like a string of words which actually may not mean anything except ahata and anahata in that you may not be able to crack most words so try it to, like a little translation avu is cow ಇಂಟರ್ಪ್ರಿಟೇಷನ್ಸ್ಟೇಷನ್ or that can be written in my opinion absolutely wonderful but ela vana lavali bana lavanga bana galali nagalata sankula bana vasiya jana galali leelandolita dola lalana mani galali ela vana lavali bana lavanga bana galali is how it begins and then it goes on and you don't try translating such perfection really as a, you know you just let it wash over you if you will there's another one called tumbi which i've really come to like and it derives or bendre says it came from reading the two lines on sruti shloka right purnam idam purnavadam purnat purnam aduchyate purnasya purnam adaya purnam eva avashishyate which is from the upanishads yes and he takes that and creates this 10 stanza poem and ee ee do tumbiya do tumbiya do tumbirade tumbi kaledaru tumbi ulidaru tumbi tumbi barade janana maranadali amruta vendigu ahudu tumbi tumbi mai dumbi tumbi hala jeeva deva jagadambe tumbi tumbi velolagu horagu padedata tumbi hadedake tumbi tumbi bayalallu ellu madivavadu tumbi dudivavanu tumbi tumbi kalugudda tumbi maraballi tumbi hasu hakki tumbi tumbi anurenu tumbi paramaanu tumbi jeevaanu tumbi tumbi tumbiddu taane endendu tudukadendendaroonu tumbi tu tubu tumbi horasu si challi tudukaadi matte tumbi mum modale tumbi molakeyali tumbi chichi gurinalli tumbi ele naneyu tumbi hu hiichu tumbi midikai hannu tumbi and he goes on you know
Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. And um, did you translate Nihinga Noda Veda Yes, I have translated that. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, there, there's an anecdote, like it's being used as a romantic song sometimes. Yes, like yes. people perceive it as a romantic song. Yes. But the story is something else. It Could is, you please like, uh, uh, talk about that? Yeah, so Nihinga Noda Vyada Nanna is one of Kannada's most famous Bhava Gita's, you know, Bhava Gita's of the 20th century. Everybody has listened to it. The rendering, there are two, one by C. Ashwat and one by Rajkumar Bharati. C. Ashwat has the first stanza, Anand Swami also? Oh, Raju Anand Swami, but I think he, but he doesn't sing all the stanzas either, right? Huh. One of them sing. One singer sings four stanzas and the other singer sings three stanzas. And I think that may have led to this misinterpretation of it as a love song, when in fact it's a song of sorrow really. Ni hinga noda vyada nanna, ni hinga nodidara nanna, na hanga nodali ninna is the refrain. And Bendre is telling his wife, who is <coughs> grieving, yes, at the loss of their child. And for some reason, it came to be thought of as a love poem because it's addressed to a woman and a man's addressing it to a woman. But it wasn't that at all. It was a poem of grief. And from what I understand, later on, Paman Bendre, who writes notes sometimes to Bendre's poems, has said that Bendre actually was traveling by train back home to Dharwad. And his wife had given birth. And I think it was just a few days old, this child. And he sees he, a vision that the child is, has died. And then he composes this poem on the train back to uh, Dharwad, to his home. And then uh, it is uh, published, more or less. But uh, it isn't one of those things where a man sees a woman and sort of talks uh, to her romantically. It's a lot different. And you're right that it's uh, been misinterpreted. And I think nowadays people are coming to learn that that's the case. But earlier it used to be sung as a romantic song. You're right. So, uh, yeah. Good evening. Uh, every uh, poem is a uh, philosophy at the same time. Feelings and philosophy. So, uh, how much uh, difficult it was to uh, de and reach his uh, philosophy when you were translating this, his all poems? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, like I said, the first uh, stage of my translations happened after I'd engaged with his poetry, read about his poetry, read parts of his poems, and then I went to Sunat Kaka's uh, blog and read his explications of these poems, his explanations, and used them to uh, create my translations, you know, understand the poems first and then create my translations. And uh, as far as Bendre's philosophy is concerned, a lot of my translations, and I say that in the book, were made in order for me to better understand the poem myself, you know, by transferring it into a language I knew best, which was English. That was one of the primary reasons I began to translate Bendre also, in addition to other reasons. Or one of the reasons, not the primary reason, definitely an important reason. And so his philosophy, I don't know that it is what shall I say? There's a single sutra or a single philosophy running through his works. I haven't engaged in a study of the 1,427 poems he wrote in Canada. That's the output he had in Canada. And I haven't engaged with them all. And uh, I think Kavyam Anandaya, which is uh, something that he quotes in one of his uh, essays, is, was one of his main motivations, you know? poetry for joy, and he uses that word in Kannada, higgu, which is the Kannada for ananda, if you will. But it has, like ananda, other meanings of sort of spreading also. And uh, I usually try to engage with a poem like a rasika, as much as I could, which meant that I was not trying to really interpret the poem like perhaps uh, a commentator, like uh, Kirna Kurtkoti did or G.S. Amur did, you know. I mean, they need to be interpreted. But I was reading them, reciting them, and then after they'd sort of 
I found something in them that spoke to me almost. It was when I tried to translate them and that was when I looked around at the beginning for some sort of a, uh, an explanation. But as I grew into uh, it, I began to try to understand it myself and see what I could do myself with the, the poem and see if I was understanding it as uh, in the right sense and I'd often send my translations to Sunat Kaka to ask him what he thought of them. He gave me some very uh, good feedback too uh, and uh, Deepa who's read the poems also the peacocks upon your lips so it could have been upon your face is what she had suggested in one case. In one, another case of Jogi, uh, Kaka gave me a suggestion where uh, I'd written stray something and he called them rogue because rogue cattle and that is what I used in the translation. So uh, I engaged with it mostly through listening to it and reciting it. I didn't get a chance to recite Jogi so if I might uh, do that now, I'll talk about Jogi in particular. It's a poem that I came across again as song and it's been very nicely tuned but only 6 of the 12 stanzas have been sung because again t time constraints and everything. And what's very interesting about it is that it's written in this meter that Bendre basically invented in order to translate Kalidasa's Meghaduta into Kannada. So, in some ways, I see it as a, or it's possible to think of it as a transfer across not, not just one language, but two languages. Bendre creating a meter for Kalidasa's Meghaduta, which is written in the Mandakranta meter famously. And then I tried to create a meter in English that approximated Bendre's recreation or invention, an invented meter. It came to be called the Meghaduta meter. And, uh, the Meghaduta meter basically is found in the shloka of Shantakaram Bhujagashayanam Padmanabham Suresham Vishwadharam Gagana Sadrusham Meghavarnam Shubhangam and that's the same thing that you find in Kaschit Kanta Viraha Guruna Swadikara Pramattaha Shapena Stanga Mita Mahima Varsha Bhogena Bhartuhu These are the two first two lines of the Meghaduta and then Bendre goes on to tra translate this as and finds an English meter for it, for a Kannada meter for it. This is how it goes on. And this Jogi is set in this meter because once he created that, I think he wrote about a hundred poems in this meter. You know, he just fell in love with it, I think. And he, created so much poetry in that meter itself, the Kannada Meghaduta meter, which was one of the two meters he introduced or invented. The other was the Sakhi Gita meter. And both of them sort of seamlessly became part of the Kannada tradition, you know, which is again something extraordinary. Uh, and I wanted to end with singing Jogi because uh, of this, of all that it represents and because it's just such a wonderful poem, which I've managed to translate in its entirety after learning it by heart. The reason I learned it by heart is because I wanted to listen to it and they only sung six stanzas. So the only way I could do was to listen to myself. And so I learned all 12 stanzas and then sung it to myself over and over again. I also sung it to myself a thousand times or thereabouts, you know. And I had no thought of translating it at all. I just used to sing it. It was so nice and I sang it at home enough times for my father to learn it by heart. And so, yeah, that was what I was doing. I wasn't looking to translate it. And then one day I went ahead and thought, let me see what this line would look like. And yeah, after I, without knowing, let it sort of become something I knew so well. It was after that happened that I began to translate it. And so I like to usually recite a few stanzas at poem and as a kind of uh, <coughs> curtain call exactly to, to, uh, to a uh, event. So, with your permission, I'll do that. Uh, so, if there are any more questions, perhaps I'll take them and then end with this. Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Namaste. Nanang niyugatun niyung nangatila. <laughs> 
ಬೇಂದ್ರೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರಾಗೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಒಂದು ಇವೆಂಟ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ವಿ ನೀವು ಯು ವರ್ ಯು ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ದಟ್ ಪರ್ಫಾರ್ಮೆನ್ಸ್ ಕಬ್ಬನ್ ಪಾರ್ಕ್ ವಿ ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ಮೀಟ್ ದ ಗ್ರೂಪ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಸಂಡೆ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಸೊ ವರ್ ಇನ್ ಎನಿ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಯು ವರ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಇಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯು ನೌ ದಟ್ ಪ್ಯಾಂಡಮಿಕ್ ಇಸ್ ಓವರ್ ಡಿ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಇಟ್ and uh, so in that sense it gave me a chance to present my uh, own version sung version of it before other bendre rasikas and that really was uh, gave me a lot of joy you know higgu as they say and one last uh, or yeah speaking of uh, uh, being inspired by them it was nice to know that uh, there was an audience that could uh, or was interested in the work yeah. i was doing so in that way yes it helped it was in 2019 right and so yeah. all of those things i think helped me consider or get to the point where i decided to publish them as a book i was doing my blog yeah. then but it all of these added together people telling me uh, the bendre bengaluru ago bendre program yeah. they added together to help me get to the point where i thought a book could be something that uh, was nice and that's how the book came about so yeah is it right on okay uh oh uh, hello madhava actually i i have no words to express really uh, but i would say this was really thought provoking also and what i would like to ask you if we say the difference between prose and poem in poem it is a combination of words meaning the emotion and music, mainly the rhythm or the meter behind it etc so as a translator of poems how do you see in translation how will these three get c- together conveyed or uh, not co- uh, huh. could you repeat uh-huh. which three pretty okay huh. if we say poem in poem it's the words meaning then the emotion and the music musical the meter or the rhythm i mean that's what makes poem a poem i mean or what is your idea about what makes poem a poem and not a prose and in translation then what will be retained of that no, that's, that's a yeah. very good okay. question because of what's happened since bendre wrote his poetry you know uh, it's come to be that lines are now blurred poet uh, prose poetry poetic prose all of those sort of uh, categories exist and i think kes narsin swami once uh, referred to it as uh, gadyan tundarsi padya madadanga ide you know i mean you just break up uh, prose and into lines and then create poetry uh, is what he was referring to when stuff like that was happening i think wrong with it but it was different from lyric poetry and so uh, in the the case of such poetry which uh, is more prose like in nature it's actually a lot easier to translate because then you're actually looking almost solely at meaning you know i mean uh, i i believe there was a poem that i came across and i put it into google translate a hindi poem and it did a fairly good job you know i mean it actually added something to it uh, pun that uh, wasn't in the original or something like that you know <laughs> and so it's possible to do that when it's prose and when it's fairly simple language and that's good you know i mean the whole idea of using uh, the ardunudi the spoken language uh, both in uh, american poetry and english poetry and indian english poetry is uh, a movement that uh, uh has allowed lots more people to write and create uh, their own kinds of poetry but 
a lyric poetry and that's where Bendre sort of comes in. I was looking to create a poetry that was not old fashioned because Bendre is extremely contemporary in the sense that he used the Ardubashe, he used the spoken language, it's what Wordsworth talked about, talked about. it's what Coleridge talked about in their uh, in, in their uh, as in, a, in their pamphlets, they wanted to talk or write poetry using the language of the people, spoken language of the people. But I don't think either of them ever got around to that. They couldn't. Yeats wanted to do it, but he too was the last romantic. So what had happened in general of the in the poetry I read, uh, or in the some of the translations I read of Bendre, either they Gokak did a number of translations because he was an Indian English poet and a professor of English and a Kannada poet. So his translations are very romantic and old fashioned almost. And that's the reason they don't work because they don't seem contemporary. And other translations what they did was they almost made it too contemporary and didn't uh, care too much to retain the Nada. There's a collection called Spring Fire which K. Raghavendra Rao has translated primarily with the help of Aman Bendre and K. S. Sharma. And there they haven't looked to keep this euphony, this Nada. And so my goal really was to create a contemporary poetry in English that retained Bendre's qualities or the qualities he prized, you know, the rasa, the bhava, the nada, all of them needed to be retained, especially when they were singable, they were hard gabbas, they were poems to be sung. And so that was when, and that was why I used to sing these poems out or try to find their song versions because it gave me a sense of what it would sound like if it was sung. And uh, so that was how I differentiate between poetry and prose in general, but also prose poetry and Bendre's own poetry. Uh, let answer a question. So yeah, I mean, I know it's getting late. I'll end first. I'll if uh, I suppose some of you are curious, or I should hope that you are about the title of the talk, the churn and churning of the world. Uh, it comes from a poem called Bhava Gita and the last uh, stanza of it. I translated this a long time ago because I didn't think the whole poem was translatable, but more recently I was asked to translate it and came up with a version. I don't say it's the last word or even uh, a particularly uh, faithful uh, version, though faithful uh, is sort of a strange word. Bohr has said that the the what did he say? The original is never faithful to the translation. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, the matter of having understanding all of these cultural references is different. But uh, this one, I was quite happy with, and that's where it comes from. And it involves the matu that I talked about, the talk that Bendre loved to indulge in. Matu, matu, mathi si navanita. Higabiri Higalitu Tanatane Prita Artha Villa Swartha Villa Bariya Bhava Gita is how it goes. Matu Matu Matisi Matana is the churning. Matu Matu Matisi Banda Nada Navanita. Now here is where you get into a sort of cultural difficulty. Navanita is butter. So the butter of euphony would make very little sense in English. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't have the, the cultural connotations that Navanita does still in India. It's lost. It's been lost in England. Let's say. You know, I mean, you get things like I can't believe it's not butter or something like that. You know, those kinds of uh, products. And so it's not really any more. It doesn't contain the cultural references that it, Navanita does. And so, Matu Matu Matisi uses Matu twice. I've translated that and used churn twice instead of matu twice and in the same rhythm as much as possible. Matu matu mathi si bandha nada dhanavanita The churn and churning of the word brought forth a euphony It felt a joy, it spread a joy in its own love, it was happy it did not mean, it did not want, it was just lyric poetry, is how I've looked to translate it. And that's where Swartha comes in. Swartha, Swartha, again, a pun that can't really be translated. So, if it's not too late, I'll continue. If it, it is, okay. <laughs>
I wanted to do Jogi, but yeah. Shall I? Yeah, please. Okay, sure. Okay. I, yeah, just the first thing. That's all. I mean, that's what I always do. I mean, I don't want to give away the whole thing. Otherwise, the book won't sell. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I know the Kannada poem by heart, and uh, I'll read the English poem out. Let me just remind you that it goes like, uh, oh, <clears throat> ಒಬ್ಬ ಯಕ್ಷ ತನ್ನೊಡೆಯನಿಂದ ನಲ್ಲೆಯನು ಅಗಲಿ ಬೆಂದು ಊ ಊರ ತುದಿಯ ಆ ಮೂರು ಬಟ್ಟೆ ಮುಗಿದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಳ್ಳವಲ್ಲಿ ಹಳ್ಳಾಡಗಿ ಹರಿದಲ್ಲಿ ತುಡುಗುದನ ತೊಂಡು ಮೇಯುವಲ್ಲಿ ದಿಕ್ಕು ತಪ್ಪು ತರ ತಪ್ಪಿ ಹೊಕ್ಕರ ಕಕ್ಕಾವಿಕ್ಕಿಯಾಗಿ ಇರುಳು ಅಂತನ ಹಗಲ ಗೂಗುತವ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಜೋಡ ಗೂಗಿ ಅದನ್ನ ದಾಟಿ ಆ ಮಸಣವಾಟಿ ಎಡಕಾಗಿ ಅದರ ಆಚಿ ಕಾಮ ತನ್ನ ಹಚ್ಚಂಗಿ ಹಾಸಿದಾಂಗಲ್ಲಿ ನೀರ ಪಾಚಿ ಹೊಚ್ಚಿ ಹೊಂಡವನು ಮೆಚ್ಚ ಮಾಡತವು ಕಂಡ ಕಣ್ಣುಗಳಿಗೆ ಪಾಚಿ ಸರಿಸಿದಾಗ ಕಪ್ಪು ನೀರು ಕರಿತಾವ ಒಳಗ ಬಳಿಗೆ ಅದರ ಮುಂದ ಗವಿ ಗುಡ್ಡ ಅಡ್ಡ ಬರತದ ನಮ್ಮ ಬಲಕ ಅತ್ತತ್ತ ಹರುಹಿ ಹತ್ತೊತ್ತಿ ಬಂದ ಕಾಳಮ್ಮ ಇರುವ ಹೊಲಕ ಆ ಹೊಲದ ನಟ್ಟ ನಡು ಇರುವ ಹುಣಿಸಿ ಮರ ಏರಿ ನೋಡಿದಾಗ ಹತ್ತ ಗಿಡದ ಗುಂಪೊಂದು ಕಾಣತದ ಸಣ್ಣ ಏರಿ ಮ್ಯಾಗ ಇಸ್ ದ ಕನ್ನಡ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕನ್ನಡ ಪೋಯಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಊರ ತುದಿಯ ಆ ಮೂರು ಬಟ್ಟೆ ಮುಗಿದಲ್ಲಿ ಕೊಳ್ಳವಲ್ಲಿ ಅಟ್ ದ ಎಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೌನ್ ವೇ ದ ತ್ರೀ ಫೋರ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಡ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವೇ ದ ಸ್ಲೋಪ್ ಬಿಗಿನ್ಸ್ ವೇ ದ ರನ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ ಡಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಬ್ರೋಕ್ ಕ್ಯಾಟಲ್ ಗೋ ಗ್ರೇಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ವೇ ಇಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಫ್ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಯು ಎಂಟರ್ ಅನ್ ನೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕನ್ ಪೇರ್ ಆಫ್ ಔಸ್ ಅಪ್ಯ ಹೂಟಿಂಗ್ ಥ್ರೂ ದ ಮಿಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ past that place and past the graves and beyond to the left lies such a lush of thickened moss it seems like kama's vests been spread luxuriously across the surface of the pond the moss removed black waters call into the dark beyond past all of this come caves and hills rising to the right spreading here and spreading there and crouching kalamma site and when we climb the tamarind at the center of this site we see ten bushes in a clump upon a little height <laughs>